Anyway, <coughs> uh, what I want to do to today is describe uh, recent uh, progress in understanding and modeling dynamics very close to a black hole in the context of the loss cone. And I'm going to do it in a framework that is actually much broader than is strictly necessary for describing TDEs. And there's a very good reason to do it. First of all, it's useful. TDEs are not special. They're one example of a class of infall uh, events where basically a, st a star or another object, a binary or whatever, is lost from the system once it approaches the black hole close enough. But I'm also, in, uh, so there's no reason to, to restrict the calculation just for TDEs. The other thing I'm going to focus on are events where you also have some dissipation mechanism that can take away energy from the orbit. So the prime motivation for this I is uh, the study of uh, extreme mass ratio in spirals by the emission of gravitational waves. But this is also r very relevant for the secondary TD channels like partial disruptions, which where the star may actually come back f several times or even more, s more uh, softer interactions where you just do tidal heating and create something I call a squeeze R. Or if even if you have a very massive uh, disk and then you uh, essentially um, friction against the disk and the orbit degrades. But there's also a theoretical reason to study this problem in a more general sense because an the recent advances in, in understanding and including what is called resonant relaxation, which I'll discuss very briefly, actually uh, are inconsistent with the basic standard assumption that underlie loss cone theory as it was formulated uh, 40 years ago. And furthermore, when you add uh, the some rather surprising result that came out from even more recent uh, simulations that included general relativistic effects, I'm talking about n-body simulations, I'll show an example. It becomes quite clear that the naive attempt to simply take resonant relaxation and sort of graft it on top of standard uh, loss count theory simply was, was in, um, inexact and, s and unsatisfactory. There are serious problems there. And it's necessary to basically set up some formal structure wh where you can actually describe these things in a quantitative way, understand these uh, new exotic phenomenologies that uh, arise from the inclusion of both uh, resonant relaxation and relativistic effects. And then you can, you need, because these potentially, I'm building here some suspense that will actually I'll have to diffuse later, but potentially you cannot tell whether or not these effects are very important, so you have to re-examine many of the old results. It turns out that they're not very important for the steady state behavior of si such systems, but that's not a trivial result at all, and it requires proof, so which I'm going to try and supply. So, um, aren't these supposed to move it? Uh, I'll just mention very briefly uh, the NR, just to establish the notation. If you were present here in the first day when I gave a short school talk, you already should know this formula. So two-body two relaxation is unavoidable in any system composed of interacting uh, particles. Um, in so it's a point-point interactions. Basically, the Q here, I'll use the notation that Q is the mass ratio between the black hole and a single star. and uh, because the, these are point particles, they, ca they can be as far as the size of the system and as close essentially as zero, at least formally, and therefore you get a, a very large uh, spread of possible uh, interactions, and this comes out across as an as a increase in the relaxation, a boost of the relaxation rate by a factor, by the logarithmic uh, Coulomb factor. Now, um, I should have said uh, that I'm going to focus on essentially the simplest possible system. So a single mass, a single black hole embedded in a spherical steady state system. Uh, the black hole is non-spinning. The system includes stars of only one mass. And I'm ignoring binaries or any other structures in the system. Because in a spherical system, energy and angular momentum are conserved on each orbit separately, orbital theory will not, uh, will not give us a steady flow of stars into the into the black hole, and therefore the, the processes that r send stars into the black hole are essentially collisional processes. So the story of the lost cone in this, part in this uh, limited context is essentially the story of how the system rela relaxes and, and reaches uh, or, or forgets its initial conditions. 
So two bodies definitely uh, one way to go. And fortunately, Nick already explained most of this. Let me just reiterate just to establish the notation. So here's the loss cone. Relaxation is done primarily by relaxing in angular momentum. This is a representation of phase space that I'll be using throughout my talk. So it's logarithmic. The log of the angular momentum divided by the log of the maximum angular momentum at any given energy. So this is a number that comes between 0 and 1. This is the semi-major axis. So your the black hole is that A goes to 0. Periods are higher on the in here. Red is where orbits are uh, unstable and fall directly into the black hole. So a star can be in phase space somewhere here. In a purely Keplerian system, non-collisional, if you put a star at a certain point here, it will stay there. And there's not uh, energy and angular momentum are conserved. Two-body relaxation will scatter it in energy and in angular momentum, the scattering size is more or less the same when you're at ma near maximal angular momentum. This comes out, of course, from here. T is the typical time to scatter by order unity in energy. TL, the typical time to scatter the angular momentum by order of itself. However, every now and then, a star will get scattered into lower L. And at this point, the scattering in the L axis becomes much faster than in the E axis, so it gets scattered, and eventually it will plunge directly into the black hole. As, as was argued uh, quasi-empirically by uh, Nick, the most of the flux comes from around the rough the roughly the radius of influence of the black hole. So to uh, fairly uh, a good kind of order of magnitude estimate is that the rate of plunges, I'll call these plunges, of course, here this was the innermost stable orbit. I'm, I will be thinking about compact objects that don't get torn by tidal fields, but if you want uh, to consider TDEs, you simply draw the uh, line corresponding to the tidal radius. It doesn't change the logic of the problem. So the rate for plunges is simply the number of stars up to the radius of influence divided by the uh, energy relaxation time. As pointed out by Rem, this is also basically just the inverse of the orbital time at the radius of influence and the logarithmic corrections come from more detailed calculations, which I will not try to reproduce here. Anyway, if you introduce any kind of a dissipation mechanism, for example, gravitational wave emission or maybe tidal heating, you can formally define a region in phase space where the rate at which you lose energy by this dissipation is faster than the rate whereby you change your energy by, energy by two-body scattering. And in, in this range, if your star exists in this range, <laughs> statistically speaking, it will have more chances of basically dissipating all its energy down to the point where it, it uh, is the, the power emitted by the orbital energy lost is uh, high enough to be detected. So phase space is essentially divided in two by the tip of this region. If you started out with uh, some same major axis that is above this line, you're basically back in this situation. You have a high probability of actually scattering and falling in it by direct plunge. However, if you start below this line, your line must cross this locus, and therefore you have a high, much higher chance to inspiral in. Okay, and it turns out when you do the analysis that the rates for inspiral have a very similar functional form, only you have to evaluate everything at this critical semi-major axis. And because this is typically, for example, when you compare the, the rate for tidal disruption to the rate to, to uh, inspiral by tidal heating, you find that this is the, the number of stars in this region is much, much smaller than the number of stars in the entire radius of influence. So roughly, the ratio, the inspiral ratio is always much smaller than the plunge ratio, and it comes out that in under several typical scenarios that you can think of, it's a, say, a 1% or a 1%. So inspirals are always more uh, rare. However, two-body relaxation is not the only kind of relaxation. That or the way that orbits can, can randomize. Uh, another process, which I'll explain very briefly, it's a whole subject in itself, is known as resonant relaxation, and that occurs in very symmetric potentials where the symmetries of the potentials limit the, dev the evolution of uh, orbits. For example, in a Kepl nearly Keplerian, uh, in a nearly Keplerian uh, potential, ellipses tend, tend to be frozen in space, average, and, and remain that way, for a very long time, much longer than the typical orbital time. 
So effectively, you can think of the problem as being of, of the system as consisting of instead of point masses which are moving, uh, uh, consisting of, of a set of, uh, of wire-like ellipses which are talking each other. So this, uh, because the well, as long as the ellipses are, s are uh, static, the potential is, is uh, not time-dependent, energy is conserved. So on these short time scales, the energy is not affected by this re uh, relaxation process, but the accumulated torques, due to the fact that the number of ellipses is, is finite, and even though the system is spherical, on statistically speaking, it's not uh, at any given time spherical, there are Poisson perturbations, then you will get some torques, and if you do the full calculation, you find that you can torque the, <coughs> you can actually change angular momentum by order unity over some resonant relaxation time scale. Here, the, the determining thing is the coherence time, how long the system can stay almost frozen. And the shortest randomizing process is the one that will set the coherence time. For example, if you are in a nearly Keplerian system, the, uh, far enough from the GR effects are not very important for the background stars, but there's enough mass in the stars to make s uh, induce small deviations from pure Keplerian motion. It is the enclosed mass, the precession due to the enclosed mass that sets the coherence time, which I'll call mass precession. And now, every different situation has a different uh, coherence time associated with it, it has to be analyzed, there's no uh, general formula, and therefore different uh, dependencies on the number of stars and on the parameters of the system, but we'll be mostly concerned with mass precession here. So, the reason that resonant relaxation is potentially very important, or should worry us, uh, uh, at least until we convince ourselves that it, it is uh, not relevant for any particular question, is when you compare the time scales, you find that the resonant relaxation time scale can be orders of magnitude shorter than the, the two body, which I call here NR for non resonant relaxation, as long as the coherence time is a, a large uh, number, uh, is longer than uh, some, by la some large factor f fraction than the period, period time. And if that's the case, these torques can rapidly shift anything, uh, say, on a nearly circular orbit to a nearly uh, uh, radial orbit and therefore induce a very fast interaction with a black hole. In fact, if it weren't for relativistic effects, this would act actually have a profound implications for the uh, for inspire-like events. So, what you see here is a uh, Monte Carlo simulation that is based on, on diffusion coefficients that I'll very, very briefly discuss in a few slides. But for now, this is the same phase space as I showed in the schematic plot slightly more ac accurate here. So this is where you have to, a star has to reach in order to, to start in spiraling in. But because the resonant relaxation torques are so fast, so here I, I artificially um, closed uh, GR implant precession. The torques are so fast that all the stars are thrown on plunge trajectories that you can see it here, the, traje the trajectories in phase space are depicted as flow lines. And basically, there are no stars left to reach this region. Okay, so <coughs> if you can't suppress RR, resonant relaxation, you would have zero Emrys or any other in spiral events, and all would be plunges. And th this led us, but GR actually does introduce in, um, in plane precession, Schwarzschild precession. So this has led us to introduce the fortunate coincidence conjecture, and here I'm revealing my bias. I mean, for, for people interested in TDEs, this would be TDE heaven. Many, many TDEs, okay? No, nothing wasted on these annoying and uh, uninteresting Emrys. But uh, from my perspective, this was a, uh, would be a bad uh, situation because at, at that time I was, uh, still am, interested in Emrys. And without uh, knowing how to actually introduce our in a, in a formal way into the story, we conjectured that the GR implant precession has the correct sensitivity, and this is really a coincidence because there's nothing to coordinate a priori GR with the physics that underlie resonant relaxation. One is a theory of gravity, the other is a kind of a collective behavior in a Keplerian or Neocoplerian system. But we conjecture that the, these uh, dependencies are, are strong enough so that before the star can reach this point, 
GR, the, the GR precession will change the shape yeah, of this <laughs> the shape of the orbit in a way that the torques will switch sign every time it turns by pi. Okay? So <coughs> this was the state of the matter uh, 2006. Uh, some five years later, in a work with David Merritt, we, we tried to simulate it. This was the first uh, reliable code to introduce GR in a self-consistent way into an n-body simulation. And very briefly, what you see is that, let's see if it will, when you look, you kind of squint at many tracks like this, you, you get the impression that there is some line, this was drawn by I at the time, without much uh, a priori theoretical justification, that there are a, ch a line that the stars refuse to cross. So this was roughly where we thought that the GR precession would be strong, but we didn't imagine that it would be so strong as to not, as to prohibit stars from crossing all, o all the way to, um, to, the, to be plunge into the black hole. And I mean, if that were true, maybe that would have solved Nick's conundrum with the, with the missing flares. And it was also to some extent that there are some, this, when you analyze what happens to stars near that point of reflection or seeming reflection, you could see all kinds of oscillations in the orbital parameters at the frequency of the GR precession. So it seemed that the, the two were tied, but there was a lot of confusion. Also, other uh, numerical works didn't quite get the same results, and uh, it was clear to me that, this is that the uh, results that we offered in that paper were, were must be an incomplete. So, I'm now going to, I'm ov obviously not going to go into the equations, I'm just I just want to make a statement about s uh, successful results. If you don't believe me, you can go and read it in the paper. So, a, a former student of mine, Ben Barrer, who's now in Princeton, in the IAS, has really, in a tour de force, managed to come up with a completely formally, uh, formally grounded uh, scheme to describe resonant relaxation in the context of uh, stochastic dynamics. Okay, so the key thing here, it took us a while to understand, realize, is that we must, at this point, consider the torques by the, by the background as this kind of a stellar noise that must be a correlated noise. Okay, and correlations are inherently uh, inconsistent with the idea of diffusion. Diffusion assumes zero correlation, which is why this problem is so difficult. You have to somehow m merge together Hamiltonian dynamics with stochastic theory, and always the, the in-between regions of, of, of two extreme theories are those that are hardest to model. And this model, the outcome of this model is, is this following. If you in, in, uh, assume some stellar noise, you can get formally stochastic equations of motions that allow you to evolve a test star if you generate some noise sequences, okay? And then, and this is the, the no, totally non-trivial part, you can actually find or argue and prove by, this, uh, by these uh, simulations that with some uh, approximations, this you can find out effective uh, diffusion coefficients that m allow you to treat this problem as if it were diffusion. And these diffusion coefficients have the following property. They look at the, at the correspondence between the power in the noise and the precession frequency. So if the noise is smooth, there's always some maximal frequency to it. And this maximal frequency then means that <coughs> here we have some different noise properties. Only the purple line is smooth. These are the, the correlation functions. You see that the width of the correlation functions is, is not very different. The, the key difference is how smooth they are or how differentiable they are. And if you compare them to totally uncorrelated diffusion coefficients as function of angular momentum, you have diffusion at all angular momenta. But if you have a purely smooth noise, that's the purple line, the diffusion basically is totally quenched if your angular momentum is low enough. So there is a region of low angular momenta, nearly radial orbits, where your precession is so fast that the background basically cannot catch up with you. This is adiabatic invariance, okay? So, in f it's quite surprising that the actual properties of the noise have never been measured in n-body simulation. It's actually not that simple to do it accurately. This is a demonstration of the importance of the noise assumption about noise smoothness. In this simulation, we start with the delta function at j nearly circular. We let it evolve. 
It never evolves, this is the, the distribution function, it never evolves beyond some uh, minimal J naught. But if the noise is, no is not completely smooth, and here the smoothness is only very minimal, you already get total saturation up to what you would expect in as the maximum entropy limit, which is uh, a basic thing. You can see it here also in full phase space. You start only on very short time scales. Two body relaxation is, is irrelevant. The these are examples of trajectories. They get stuck on this line. This is the line that was assumed in Merit 2011. It's wrong, we believe, but Merit does not agree. Um, if you wait for about a sixth of a relaxation time, you already start having diffusion. Two body does not uh, respect. Yeah, I know. I'll just finish here. Two body does not respect this. And then if you wait long enough, you basically reach back the, the, the normal uh, uh, two body expected uh, distribution. And let me just tell you that the results that you can get with this correct calculation are basically, you can now calculate under all the limitations I mentioned, assuming the uh, bacal wolf cusps, etc. you can calculate self-consistently plunge rates and inspire rates. They come out to be ex very, very similar to what you would get by the naive scaling because uh, statistics always wins at the end and you, uh, as and you reach the maximum entropy. And I'll conclude here before I get bashed on the head by the chairman with my conclusions. You can read them and I'll be happy to answer some questions if there's time. Thank you. It will accelerate everything. The it will accelerate normal relaxation, then two-body relaxation. It will accelerate um, resonant relaxation. The key thing is the relative position of the region where resonant relaxation is strong. It's this region. The, the, the key thing is that the region where resonant relaxation is strong is away from the loss lines. It's away from the plunge line. It's away from the, from the embry line. Any, well, as long as it remains away from it with these lines, it cannot really affect what eff with the, the rate at which stars cross. Now, I, I haven't tried it in practice. My gut feeling is that it won't, won't change this uh, basic topology. The resonant relaxation remains. Here are the S stars, by the way. The S stars may be affected by resonant relaxation, but emrys and plunges are not affected. You discuss how I mean, GR precession or mass precession from the stellar potential can create enough apsidal precession to, to shift the background and, and, and quench the mm -hmm. coherent perturbations. But those coherent perturbations from the residual excess torque, they also should shift the longitude of pericenter of the stellar orbits by, by pulling on the stars. You mean a resonant relaxation itself? So, so is there ever a regime where it self quenches and that's what sets the. So as itself? far as we can tell, we, th this is not known. What I know is that it doesn't really matter very much which model I assume. Um, I don't think it will change the story. In fact, with a, with a student, we're now trying to actually measure some properties of the background noise in the end body simulation. So we can, instead of just putting it as input, we can actually uh, justify which, which, mo which res recipe we're using. Yes, but that would be probably too extreme. I think that the, the most natural justification for the noise being smooth and having a, a, some cutoff is because it is the superposition of orbital motions which are smooth. So even though you're in the statistical limit, it's a statistical limit of, of the sum of many smooth functions, time-varying functions, so it will also be smooth. Okay, 